We are continuing our discussion on the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic and with new case numbers rising in parts of the country, including here in Florida, many residents are questioning what we should do next. The CDC has issued new recommendations for those who are fully vaccinated, while masks are still required throughout many Central Florida communities and more vaccine and testing sites are opening to accommodate the numbers. So what does all of this mean for you? Well, on this special edition of Healthy Connections, we're going to get an up to date look at where we are as a community dealing with this pandemic. Our first guest is the very busy Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings here to give us an update of what's going on here in Orange County. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for being with us today. Hello, Clarence, and hello, everyone. Uh, it has been a busy week for us here in Orange County, but it's been a busy year for all of us as we have tried to navigate successfully through the pandemic. I do believe that we're turning the corner here now within our community, especially since we now have ample supply of vaccine available for our residents to be able to get their shots. So we encourage everyone to do so. Uh, we have a multitude of places where you can now go and get the vaccine. So we can talk about all of that uh, if you like to today. Absolutely. And you know, earlier this week, you uh, made some announcements about how we should govern ourselves um, during this phase of the pandemic. Can you give us a rundown of some of the things that have changed? We issued the, the first uh, mandatory facial covering of masks order in June of last year. So it's been nearly a year since that period of time. There is not a day that goes by where someone doesn't ask me the question, when will we get to the point in time where we no longer have to wear a facial covering? So what we did this week was to try to give guidance to our community. There will be a phased approach to that effort. Currently, we are in what we have defined as phase one. And phase one now allows us to reduce the social distancing uh, when we're either outdoors or indoors from the traditional six feet to three feet now. And if you're outside and you are in the company of a small gathering and you know the people around you and you have been vaccinated, there really is no need for you to wear a facial covering. If you're in a large gathering and you're outside, you need to wear a facial covering. Now, if you're inside and you are less than six feet away, it is a requirement that if you're indoors, you're required to wear a facial covering if you're outside of your home, uh, if you are outside of people who you know to have been fully vaccinated, you're required to wear a facial covering. However, uh, what we are saying here is that we have increased the capacity by reducing the distance requirements indoors from six feet to three feet. Of course, in you, if you're in a restaurant and you're eating or you're drinking, uh, you're not required to wear a facial covering now. Now, we will move to phase two in our community when our community reaches the point where 50 percent or more of the individuals who are eligible for the vaccine uh, have been inoculated with at least one dose. Now, 50 percent of our population is very attainable. Today, we're at 43.66% of those 16 years of age and older who have received at least one dose of the vaccine. So likely, as we are now in uh, approaching the first day of May, uh, it will likely be mid to late May before we reach that 50% threshold. Once we reach that threshold, individuals who are outdoors will not be required to wear facial coverings. Individuals indoors will still be required to wear facial coverings when they are amongst people who have not uh, been fully vaccinated. When we get to phase three, uh, the threshold there is 70% of the population that is 16 years of age or older. When we reach that point, uh, no one will be mandated to wear facial coverings. Now, even at that point, uh, individuals may not feel comfortable not wearing their facial coverings when they're around others, and that would be their personal choice, but there would be no mandate. 
the Department of Health projects that we will reach that 70 percent of our population that would have been vaccinated with at least one dose in uh, late June to July period of time. So we have uh, a ways to go before we get to that point. In order to get there, it is going to require everyone in our community who is eligible to seek getting vaccinated. Now, there are a few people because of the medical condition, et cetera, that cannot get the vaccine. Other than that, I strongly encourage everyone, please help our community, help yourselves, protect your family uh, from uh, the virus by getting vaccinated. What we're trying to do is get up to that community immunity, sometimes referred to as herd immunity, in which uh, as a society, once we reach that 5% uh, or less of the average positivity rate for a sustained two-week period of time, we'll be there. So phase three has two components. One, 70% of the population, 16 and above, will need to be uh, vaccinated. And we need to have sustained positivity rates for 14 days at 5% or less. And, you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, one of the things that is really encouraging is that um, the partnerships that have been created to get the vaccines into the community. Um, and so people who don't have access to getting to the convention center or getting to Valencia College, they it's bringing the vaccines to them. And that would help us get to those thresholds. Is, is that true? With this last segment of our population that needs to get vaccinated, it is going to be absolutely critical that we make it as convenient for them as possible. That means that we're going to have to take it right into their neighborhoods, offer them the opportunity perhaps right in their own homes in order to get the numbers up at this point. When we look at those who are 65 years of age and older, we have already 71 percent or better of that population that has already been inoculated. We really want to get to that point for everyone. So what we have decided to do at the end of May, we will no longer be offering vaccine at the Orange County Convention Center. In fact, this weekend will be the last period of time that we will be offering the first dose of uh, vaccine at the convention center. So what we're going to do is replace that with these mobile vaccine sites that will be strategically located throughout the county. They'll be located uh, initially at our various magic gyms. Those are the county-owned gymnasiums throughout the county. We'll be offering uh, opportunities to get vaccinated there. For information and addresses on the list, we encourage people to go to our website at ocfl.net slash vaccine, and the address will be listed there. In addition, there have been significant partnerships with retail pharmacies. So all of our local retail pharmacies uh, that are Walgreens, CVS, they will have the opportunity uh, to get vaccinated at any of those locations as well. And then in some cases, uh, local physician's offices will be offering the vaccine. And then you can go to the community health centers to also uh, get vaccinated. If you're a veteran, you can go to the VA hospital. Uh, we still have the Valencia FEMA site that is set up here in West Orange County. Uh, that site will be closing in just a, uh, a week or two, and so that will come to an end. But we're also going into the local high schools. Uh, this week, uh, we partnered with Orange County Public Schools and the Department of Health to offer, offer vaccine to those 16 years of age and older at Orlando Evans High School, Colonial High School, and Jones High School. And those uh, will be continuing throughout the weekend during this first weekend in May. So actually there is no excuse whatsoever <laughs> that you not, won't be able to find a vaccine, uh, a, a shot. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, testing and if that's still going on and whether or not we're still encouraging people to get tested who haven't been or have been uh, vaccinated. Yes, we're going to continue the free testing uh, at the Barnett Park. In addition, we're going to be offering one lane without appointments uh, for people to get vaccinated at Barnett Park. We're going to be doing that for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, that process is beginning uh, this first weekend in May as well. And uh, we will continue to do some testing at the Orange County Convention Center, but that will likely uh, come offline at the end of May as well, and we'll transition uh, the testing to other locations throughout the county also. Again, one of the ways that you can ensure that you know your status is visit your personal physicians. And if you do not have one, we encourage you to go to Barnett Park uh, to get tested. And you know, Mr. Mayor, a lot of people are still dealing with the repercussions of really last year's lockdowns. A lot of the um, businesses have not gotten back to where they were pre-pandemic. And, and so the uh, Orange County Emergency Rental Assistance Program has really been valuable. Can you tell us a little bit about who's eligible for that program and does it also include uh, mortgage assistance? Individuals in our community who can demonstrate that they have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic only need to show that they have experienced a reduction in their work hours, uh, they have not been able to meet their rental payments, uh, and if so, if they're able to produce the documentation, they would become eligible for up to $10,000 in rental assistance. That program is ongoing. Orange County received $33 million from the federal government to assist with individuals to keep them in their homes so that they do not become homeless. They don't lose their apartments or their homes. In terms of mortgage payments, it, this is about rental assistance. It's not to uh, pay mortgage payments because that is not something that meets the federal guidelines today. And you know, as we are, are in this phase of the pandemic, you can start to see lots of uh, visitors coming back to Florida, coming back to Orlando uh, to go to the parks. Um, and it's up to us to really be the example for those people visiting from other places. What would you tell Orange County residents about maintaining um, their, their pandemic readiness uh, and, and not be uh, lured in by people who might be from other places who, who really don't have um, the Orange County recommendations in mind when they get here? Orange County is very unique, uh, really, in the world, certainly within the United States, because we're the number one tourist destination in North America with 75 million people who would visit us on an annual basis prior to the pandemic. Of course, we saw our tourism plummet in 2020, but fortunately, our numbers are beginning to climb back up in 2021. Because of uh, this visitation that we see from around the world, it makes us somewhat vulnerable. So it is important that those of us who live here get ourselves protected against the virus. At the same time, we want to protect our uh, economy. We want to ensure that we are creating jobs, maintaining jobs for individuals so that they can go to work and take care of their families. And so we have programs and partnerships that we have uh, entered into uh, to collaborate with Valencia, with uh, UCF, and with Orange Technical College to do upskills training for individuals so that if you lost your job, if you were working in the service industry, the hospitality industry, and uh, you needed a job, one of the industry sectors where employment continued to arise was in the manufacturing and technology sectors. And so we uh, partnered with uh, these uh, community uh, educational institutions to retrain individuals so that they could move into higher paying jobs, actually. And so we, however, are seeing uh, within the service industry, within the tourism and hospitality industry, uh, jobs coming back online now as people are coming in and staying in our hotels. It has created a lot of business activity. What I can tell you is that during the pandemic, a number of our businesses reinvented themselves. Uh, they were able to change uh, their business models and they are thriving. Some businesses here within our area will make more money uh, during the pandemic than they did pre-pandemic because they were able to make those adjustments uh, in their business model. So we encourage individuals that if you uh, own a small business, 
uh, we will be receiving additional American Rescue Plan dollars. It is estimated that Orange County will receive an additional 270 plus million dollars. A portion of those dollars will be made available to assist our small businesses and our individuals and families who are still hurting from the pandemic. However, the federal government has not uh, pushed out the guidelines for the use of those dollars at this point. So we are awaiting those final uh, guidelines and then we'll make announcements to the public soon. Well, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for being with us today and thank you for shepherding us through uh, these very challenging times. We appreciate you. As always, Clarence, you do a wonderful job and thank you to Orange TV, TV for what they do as well. It's our pleasure. Have a great day. Have a great day. And we'll be right back with more. Stay with us. Let's get an update from our state medical professionals. And joining me is Alvina Chu, epidemiologist with the Florida Department of Health in Orange County. And she's joining us live in the studio for the first time. So we're very happy to have you here, Alvina. Thank you so much for having me here in person and in 3D. <laughs> right, right. So we're wearing masks because Alvina is here. We are about three feet away. And of course, that is one of the things that we heard here in Orange County, but we still have a six feet mask mandate uh, in place, a six feet distance uh, that you're supposed to keep from people. Right, so uh, the recommendation is, you know, further away is better than closer, and so six feet is a good recommendation. Six feet better than three feet, and three feet better than nothing at all. And so as much distance as we can um, do to separate will help us try to uh, limit the spread and uh, transmission of COVID-19. Absolutely. And also, where are we in, in the, the um, Orange County when it comes to dealing with the coronavirus and, and how we're doing trying to stem the tide of positive uh, tests and getting people vaccinated. Right, so we still are continuing our efforts with the contact tracing to try to get the message out there to persons who are sick and who are positive that they should isolate at home and certainly stay away from others and also recommended guidance for persons who are considered to be close contacts, which is those persons who are within six feet for greater than 15 minutes and certainly your household members um, and uh, persons who you might have close contact with. Those recommendations for those persons to quarantine so that we can limit the spread. And so those activities continue as well as our um, vaccination efforts, which uh, I think you all have heard about a lot um, recently. Um, so we've um, been able to vaccinate uh, almost 60 or 70 percent of seniors, those 65 plus, and we're working on that goal of getting to at least a half of the population in Orange County, um, getting a, their first dose, um, certainly by summer, before summer. And, you know, there are people who are taking their first dose of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine and have yet to get their second dose. They have actually gone past their date to get their second dose. Why is it important that we get that second dose? So certainly after the first dose, you build up some immunity, but after the second dose is when you get the most protective effect from these vaccines. And so the vaccines um, that the Pfizer and the Moderna were evaluated as two dose series. So after the second dose is when you're considered, you could be considered to be fully immunized. And so it's incredibly important to get that second dose so that we can help limit this transmission because even after the first dose, you might still possibly be susceptible to the COVID-19. So um, I, we just wanted to mention there's also no, not necessarily a maximum interval. So if you, um, you are recommended for the greatest best effect to get the two doses on the interval that's recommended. But if you miss that, you will still get a benefit from getting the second dose um, at any time after that. And you don't have to restart the series. So it's not too late, which it's is not too right. late. If yeah. you missed your your three week or two mm -hmm. week appointment, it's not too late. It's that's certainly not too late. And we wanted to mention that uh, we have um, from Orange County, um, the convention center data. Um, we know there's about 43,000 people who have missed their second dose. And we would like to encourage everyone who uh, to come get their second dose. I always say it's if you don't get the second one, it's like you're walking around with one shoe. You know, <laughs> you want to make sure you get that second dose. Mm -hmm. To be fully protected. So there are uh, partnerships that are happening right now in Orange County 
in order to get more vaccines into neighborhoods. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right, so we've been working with uh, certainly our Orange County government um, and other uh, community partners to try to get some mobile vaccination sites um, into communities that might have been traditionally underserved. Um, those with uh, so harder access to healthcare or limited transportation um, or further away from city centers. And so we're trying to make it easier and more accessible um, to persons who have not yet gotten their vaccine to go ahead and get that so that we can bring down the rates in Orange County and hopefully move towards, you know, more normal life by summer. And are we still encouraging people to go out and get tested if they've yet not yet been vaccinated? We uh, certainly do encourage people to get tested, um, especially after an exposure so that they can be aware of whether or not they are positive and then uh, stay at home and stay at home if they're sick or positive um, to present, prevent additional infections or transmission. Excellent. I've heard of several cases of people getting COVID after they've been vaccinated. Is that something that's rare or is that something that just can happen? It can happen. So no vaccine is 100% effective. And also some people uh, develop immunity a little bit differently. And so it's not, um, it's not unheard of and it's not common. So it's, but it does happen. Are we seeing the um, amount of coronavirus um, expand in younger uh, demographics with young people? So throughout the pandemic, um, we have seen that younger persons, those, you know, with more riskier behavior or who are out and about more um, than in older populations, those have been the primary drivers of the, our pandemic. So across um, Orange County and Florida, the median age has ranged from about 30 to 33. And so that remains. And also um, one thing to take into consideration now versus the beginning of the pandemic is that we have really high vaccination rates in our older population. So the 65 plus is about 70% or more um, vaccinated. And so circulating virus would um, sort of gradually move towards younger persons. And as we're sort of trying to get ourselves out of pandemic mode, then we're having to deal with these variants that are posing a threat in communities all across the country. But are vaccines uh, effective against variants? Currently, we know that the vaccines that we have developed are uh, at least effective against preventing severe hospitalization and death um, in those who are fully immunized. And so we encourage to um, everyone to get vaccinated so that one, we can reduce the transmission and the spread and also so that we can help prevent severe hospitalizations and deaths. Um, especially for those who are the most vulnerable. Absolutely. Well, Elvina, it has been a pleasure to have you in the studio with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. And of course, we always appreciate the work that you do and keeping us informed from the front lines. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. And of course, we'll be right back. Stay with us. A global crisis like this pandemic can bring forth wonderful examples of heroism and selflessness, but communities also experience higher instances of scams and fraud as well. Joining me is Victoria Funes, AARP's Florida statewide fraud expert to talk about the COVID scams and how to protect yourself. Victoria, thank you for being with us today. Hi, thank you for inviting me on the program. So, Victoria, why are the number of scams increasing the, during COVID-19? Well, fraud is a crime of opportunity. And during times of stress and isolation and uncertainty, which are definitely the times we have been living for the past year, uh, it creates the a ripe opportunity for people that are looking out to scam you to come up with all kinds of new uh, new scams and new things that are related to those opportunities that are present in the times. And what kind of COVID-19 scams are we starting to see? We have seen variations of scams that are well known and have been around for a very long time. I am going to mention a few, but I'd like to emphasize that the objective of all scams is to steal your, your personal information in order for you know for financial gain or to make you pay something in order for you to obtain something that they're promising you that of course is not legitimate during these times we have things um we are seeing things like vaccine kits uh covid kits miracle drugs 
um, work at home because again, a lot of more people are staying at home. They're spending more time at home. Anytime that you get solicited online and they are asking you for a lot of your personal information, that information is being mined. Again, with the intent of obtaining that information to eventually get to your finances or to make you pay for something. Things as, um, as you know, simple as inviting you to, to do surveys or games that you may not know right away until you have spent five, 10 minutes that they are actually getting to that information that it's not upfront, but once you are already into it, then this when they start asking for more. Um, of course, there's been a lot of scam also around the stimulus payments. And this is again, a variation of IRS fraud that we are very familiar with. Um, any kind of promise to get you the payments ahead of time, uh, not having to wait or being brokers, if you will, to be able for you to bypass the, the regular process and in order to get your payments up front. And you know, we, we have the, the testing, we've got the vaccines, we've got the stimulus. For a lot of people, it's pretty straightforward um, what these are, but it seems like these scams are increasing. Why is that? Again, it's, a, it's, it's the opportunity. The opportunity is there because they know that people are stressed, that they are isolated, that we're spending more time at home. We're also spending more time online and this is a very skillful set of people that go through a lot of training and they know the psychology of victimizing people. So they are professionals. You need to take this very, very seriously. They spend a lot of time uh, learning how people respond to information, how they respond to engagement. And the times are very ripe for us to have more time in our hands to be able to consider something that in the past, maybe because we were busier, we were less, um, we were spending less time at home, less time online, we would not give it a second thought. And are seniors uh, particularly um, at risk of being scammed? Seniors have been the highest impacted for, on this pandemic. They have been the ones that have gotten more seriously ill and also more fatally ill. Seniors were already isolated and now they have become even more isolated because of uh, social distancing. We also went through a, you know, a few lockdowns. So that means again, more time at home, less time talking to people, to friends, to family, uh, which is also a way to be able to get you to respond to something. If you are isolated and you're not having those conversations with a friend that may have gone through something very similar or ha may have been uh, scammed or um, has a story to share with you, that isolation creates for uh, more opportunity for us to fall victims to fraud. And what does AARP do to help uh, older adults uh, through these times that we've been in, which have been very challenging? We, uh, and this has been going for a few years, we have a very proactive Fraud Watch Network program that um, provides a lot of intelligence that we obtain from our partners that are uh, fraud regulators and the agencies that prosecute these crimes. So um, it gives you not only the psychology of scams or how not to become a victim of scams, but it's, all, it's always updating you on what's common, what's popular, what's trending. Because scams go through a geographical pattern. Sometimes it's popular in Florida and then they move someplace else and then we inherit other frauds that are popular in other states. So the Fraud Watch Network, I would say, is your first line of defense to be able to keep you informed and updated. Um, so it will make you less likely to fall victim of a crime and more informed so you are able to recognize if it sounds a little suspicious, it's probably fraud. And if you have read about it, you are less likely to fall victim. 
For those of us over the age of 50, AARP has really been a resource for so many different things. Uh, what kind of resources does AARP provide for seniors during this pandemic specifically? Well, I want to go back for a minute to Fraud Watch Network because we also had volunteers that are trained fraud fighters. And we have an 800 number uh, that is 877-908-3360. That people can call and they can actually uh, speak to trained fraud fighters that will give you information as to where to report if you suspect that you have been a victim of crime. Uh, if you're not sure, you can speak to them because they are taking these calls every day, nine to five. And it will give you peace of mind to be able to speak to someone that um, is an expert in the subject and will, will know where to refer you. Also, because of these times have been so challenging, um, we created a community connections site that it's really a wonderful opportunity to be able to reach out to members in your community or to receive calls. And sometimes a friendly voice is all it takes, right? So through community connections, people can volunteer to make calls to seniors in their community or seniors can request that somebody calls them. And it doesn't have to be anything specific. It can just be a friendly chat or you may be in need of some resources that they will be able to direct you to. And what advice would you have for seniors who are trying to navigate through um, real information and, and encountering the potential for scams and frauds? What advice would you tell them? I think it's key to never respond with any personal information to unsolicited requests for anything. Whether it's a trip or you won um, a lottery or a, a magic uh, you know, potion that is going to keep you safe during the, the, uh, the uh, pandemic. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Never, never share this information that you have not solicited yourself. Ask questions if they are engaging you either online or on the phone or whether you can contact them back. I guarantee you that most times they will hang up because there's nothing to call back. And one last thing that I wanted to mention is um, gift cards because this is something that has been trending a lot lately. And that is a scam that brings you in for a variety of reasons, a variety of stories. But the catch is that they want you to make some kind of payment in order to unlock the great benefit or the great gain that you're going to have. And they ask you to provide that payment via gift cards. Of course, you know that once you buy the gift cards and you give them the number, that money is gone and you will never be able to recuperate it. And we actually have a clip, which is one of our video, uh, informational videos that we have on Fraud Watch Network that speaks a lot about gift cards and why you should never buy gift cards and send them to people that you do not know. Well, Victoria, thank you very much for being with us and uh, exposing some of the scams that are out there and more importantly, how to protect ourselves. We appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. And of course, we'll be right back with more. Stay with us. Gift cards are popular and convenient and not just as gifts. Con artists have latched onto them as an easy and untraceable way to steal your money. Here's what you need to know about gift card payment scams. If you are contacted about an urgent financial matter and told the quickest way to address the issue is to buy one or more gift cards, it's a scam. The criminal will ask you to share the numbers on the back of the card, but once that happens, the fraudster has your money instantly. Scammers may refer to gift cards as electronic vouchers, but make no mistake, legitimate businesses will never ask you to pay a fee or debt by purchasing a gift card. It's best to disengage immediately and report the interaction to the AARP Fraud Watch Helpline at 877-908-3360. For more about gift card payment scams, go to aarp.org slash gift cards.
We've heard from a variety of leaders today trying to keep us informed about the coronavirus from local government, the medical community who's on the front lines dealing with this pandemic and organizations who continue to serve our community. And of course, we are also here to help you keep making those healthy connections. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.